Well, good evening um, from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Kevin Eakin. This is my wife, Cheyenne. And we are beyond honored to get to teach this fourth uh, part of the series on evangelism. Um, we love Pastor and Pastora uh, more than words could even say. Uh, uh, Pastor Clay and Aaron, Pastor Tanache and Yvonne, and <laughs> just about everybody else in your whole entire church. We love and adore. Um, and so we are we are really honored to teach on here. I, I think Pastor and Pastor are very brave <laughs> to do it this way and ask us to do it. I think that's amazing. And to do it with an outline, which is even more brave. But we're going to do our best to do that from here. Um, <laughs> we don't have much structure here, and services can go like 12 hours. So we're going to see what happens and see what the Lord does um, yeah. As we dive into this, I want to read some of the questions mm -hmm. that were brought up, and uh, we're going to do our best to answer those with what the Bible says, not our opinions, and not even all of our experiences, but only the things that line up with what the Word of God says. Oh, nice. And um, over the last month, we've had a pretty wild time here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, Roland Baker come in from Mozambique, and we had David Hogan here, who came bringing incredible amounts of fire. And when you talk about evangelism, I mean, does it get any more straight arrow than those two? And so we have, uh, a lot of our mindsets, mindsets have been completely shifted and rocked. And so I think uh, I'd love for Cheyenne to start out and share something that just recently happened. Um, and it wasn't intentional and it wasn't us going out knocking on people's doors, but it was the presence of God drawing. And so I'd love for you to hear what the Lord started doing. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, <laughs> this doesn't work, we'll just do it live and you can do it. That's so good. <laughs> this is what I would do live. <laughs> I know. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Okay, <laughs> this is really serious for me and really joyful. So beautiful. Okay, um, so this morning. Um, as we were preparing to to record this video for you all, we got a message on our Facebook account. It's our church account, so Eyes on Jesus. And I just want to read a little bit of this text. Okay, I won't read all of it. It's a really, really long message. Um, hello, I hope whoever is seeing this is having a good day. I stumbled on the videos of the service streams for Eyes on Jesus Nashville on YouTube. I was very moved by them, so I wanted to message saying thank you. I am a Hindu convert from Christianity. And since moving away from Christianity, I haven't really been a part of a Christian worship setting. Watching your community worship the Lord was a very moving experience. Um, this person goes on to talk about their experience in Hinduism uh, and it's very obvious what they've been trying to find is, is the presence of God. And so then, <laughs> then this person says, back when I was a professing Christian years ago, whenever I would come to a gathering of believers, I didn't feel the kind of love and intimacy with God that I wanted. And I've gone on to find God's love in my own practice. But I found myself moved to tears by your passionate and fervent worship. Your total abandon in the presence of God. It seemed as if it was the first time I've tangibly felt God's presence within the context of Jesus and Christianity. Jesus must be so pleased to see his kids worshiping with such beautiful abandon. There's something that one of the people leading worship advised the group to do in one of the couple videos I've sampled from. While you're here, and this is quoting uh, whoever was leading the worship or talking, I, I might have said this, I don't remember. While you're here, don't miss a second with Jesus because many times I'll remind our church Okay, you're here and we're singing, but don't sing something your lips aren't saying. Don't 
sing about God, sing to Him. He's here. And so this person continues quoting, while you're here, don't miss a second with Jesus. Focus, 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 eyes only on Jesus. Don't miss a second. This resonated with me deeply. And then there's, um, goes on to talk about some things, let's see. Um, and then to quote another sweet nugget I heard in one of the songs, drop the weight, pick up the faith. Thank you, thank you all. And then, um, and then they said, I can feel your community's love and appreciation of each other through your videos. And I'm just thinking of how um, the Bible says that they will know we are believers by our love for one another. Huh? That's right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for me, and back in 1999, I was uh, kneeling on my pink fuzzy rug in my bathroom. I was signed to um, Disney. I believe at this point I was already signed as a recording artist. And I was a writer for Universal Music. Uh, but I, I deeply wanted the Lord. I just didn't know how. I had actually already seen miracles. And I told everyone about Jesus. I really did. I, I, everybody I talked to, I would talk about Jesus pretty much. But I did not have him in a way that I could give him to people. I could tell them about him. I could pray and they might get healed. But I was here, whoop, 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 you know, way high highs, and then in between those visions or dreams or miracles or revival services, there's a really long gap of me walking alone. So I was on my bathroom rug for some reason at one in the morning, and, and the Lord brought me into an open vision, and I saw people lame walking and blind seeing and deaf hearing and the dead being raised and I said I want to see that and the Lord spoke to me and he said you will but it will mean a different way of living um, many more things happen uh, within two weeks I did see the dead raised my own mother died and the Lord had instructed me to start anointing myself with olive oil I had the oil the Lord said, anoint her. I said, you can raise her without the oil. And he said, anoint her with oil. Anointed her with oil. And she was raised from the dead. Um, I've been a part of five and a half dead raisings. I know that's a funny story. We can talk about that later. Uh, anyway, but he had said it would mean a different way of living. Okay. So, I actually just found out this morning what the number 15 stands for, and it stands for rest. Well, 15 years after that promise, in 2014, I was coming down my stairs. I was living at about a 98% stress level. My son had four life-threatening food allergies and 32 food sensitivities. I was a worship leader with no peace or joy. Believe it or not, I didn't even have a Bible. <laughs> I read devotionals and then I got into the really important stuff of uh, health articles to try and save my son. <clears throat> anyway, this morning I was coming down the stairs from no sleep, no sleep all night. I was much too busy worrying to sleep and I encountered God. Well, God encountered me. I wasn't looking for him. I know that the word says <clears throat> you'll find him when you seek him with all your heart and I think I have been seeking way deep in my heart for so long and didn't know how to find him and and he but he just came to me it was just in his mercy and grace and he which is how it all is he he was there I'm coming to my stairs and all of a sudden there's the presence of God and I could feel him all around and I fell on my stairs and I said what do you want and he said I want you to enter into rest I didn't know what he meant by that I didn't know um, the Bible well enough to, to know about the promise of rest <clears throat> which by the way when we sat down to do this video 
and Kevin does really well with notes, and I, I don't, so I just open the Bible, <laughs> which is how I preach or whatever I do. Um, Psalm, I turned right to Psalm 95, where he's talking about, because they refused to do what he told them, they would never enter the place of rest. And then Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4 will tell us that we should strive to enter that rest. And that's something. Uh, to strive to enter into rest. Well, the Lord inviting me into rest, that encounter with God, did not change my life. But it invited me into a changed life. And what happened after that was about, well, the Word coming to life by His Holy Spirit. And me on my hardwood floors repenting for about three to four months. As I found out that me trying to live for God and, and do good things and not do bad things was not the same as resting in God. Because resting in God can only come through trusting in God, like actual God. And that's a long story. And the reason I talk about that is because one of my favorite, personal favorite stories of evangelism so far and my wife um, was as he brought me into rest, as I was entering through repenting of all my worry and guilt and striving, um, dead works really because they weren't coming from faith and trust, and I'm coming into him through rest and trust, he started teaching me the way to evangelize. And it was... Um, he would tell me what to do, I would say yes, and then I rest. <laughs> so, for instance, I was on my way to church one morning, and we passed a really large temple. And my son said, Mom, what kind of temple is that? I said, I have no, I have no idea. <clears throat> and I won't go into that whole story right now, but I did hear in the Spirit say, if I call you to that community, will you love them? And I said, yes, Lord. I wanted to say, can I find out <laughs> who they are first? But I have learned to say yes to the Lord when he speaks. And so I said yes. And then I did look up the name just to see what type of temple it was. It's a Hindu temple. And then I didn't do anything else because it wasn't my idea. It was God's. And one thing that I'm learning is that I can't do a God idea. <laughs> it's God's idea, and He gives the word. He'll perform His word. And so I said, yes, no, that's all He wants from me right now. Unless He tells me to do something else. So, a few weeks later, I'm in Kroger, and I see a woman, and the Lord says, go love her. And I said, okay. And so I walk over to her, and I'm just like, ah. I loved her instantly. It was supernatural love. Just like, love, love, love. And I'm loving her earrings, and loving her hair, and loving her children. And then I felt the Lord say, okay, ask her what she does. <laughs> well, she was the priest's wife from that temple. Imagine that. And I said, yes, of course you are. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you did it. Of course you did it. The connection, you know. The connection to him so he could work through the trust. I trust you. I say yes to you. And then he comes through and connects me to who he's wanting to love. So we're there. Long story short, I end up in the, in the home of the priest having tea with them. It's been two or three years now since then and uh, we've met together several times and each time we've prayed together Jesus has shown up in fact um, one of their prayer requests was a baby and the Lord <laughs> healed a womb cast a demon out over the phone <coughs> as I'm leaving their house one day the priest's mother was visiting she'd only been there in America for about a week didn't speak any English. And as I'm leaving, I feel the Lord say, 
tell about the recent miracles at the church. And so I said, what were they, Lord? Because we have so many miracles, I couldn't really remember what, what had happened most recently. And he said, the unborn babies, how I've healed the babies in the womb. And I said, okay. So I told them, thinking this is so odd, you know, to tell them this. Well, come to find out, the, the priest's sister was an Ayurvedic doctor back in India. And she had had several miscarriages. And her mother wanted me to pray for her. So they brought the picture, and I asked the Lord what to do, and he said, I feel like he said, rebuke a demon from her womb. <laughs> so I did. And then I felt the gift of tongues, I felt tongues coming. So I'm like, is this okay? So I start like worshiping and speaking in tongues, and then prophesying over the mother of the priest. She falls out in the presence of God and understands what I said without having it interpreted. And she confirmed that it was true, something that had happened when she was little. Anyway, praise the Lord. I think a form of evangelism that I would have thought would be thinking that was my idea and that I had to accomplish it. What would that mean, going up to the temple, knocking on the door, trying to find someone connected. I don't know. How do you do how do you get into the priest's home? Well, if it's God's idea, you just rest in him, trust that he said it, and if he said it, he'll do it. And your next step needs to come in obedience. So when the Lord says something, then you can just trust him and obey him knowing that he will do what he said he'll do. I mean, and, and even what he tells you to do. <laughs> you don't have to do. If you will remain in him, he'll do it through you. It'll be, it'll be the fruit of his spirit. My, my mind, not just New Testament. This is just who God is. I'm thinking about Ezekiel 2. And it says, um, <laughs> The spirit of the Lord told Ezekiel, Son of man, stand up. I have something to say to you. And then it said, As he was speaking, the Spirit of the Lord came into him and set him on his feet. God says, Stand up, and then stands him up. <laughs> That's how I see it. And, you know, we really have choices, I believe. I mean, even after knowing this revelation and watching God be able to do whatever he wants through me when I'm actually in that place of rest and trust, I still choose often to do it. And then I start eventually feeling like I'm dying. <laughs> and so learning and honestly striving to enter into that place of rest here in Him, the remaining, the abiding in Him, you know, branches in the tree and, and then the fruit of the Spirit just whoop, does what He wants to do. So for me, um, it's a daily taking up my cross, daily dying to myself that still wants to do it, and coming into rest, remembering that really is the better way. And for me, it's really the only way, and I just have to remember to remember to rest and trust, because when, I, when I'm not actually trusting, I start worrying again. And I start doing again and focusing on doing and not doing. But when I'm in Him, oh, wow, does He do a lot. And that's not the point. It, it shouldn't be the point. Oh, if, if I learn. Roland Baker says this. Many times when people learn how much fruit comes through intimacy, then they want to be intimate with God to have the fruit. Well, that's not the point. And, um... The point is is being in God, being with God. But then he does do miracles. He reaches people. He'll evangelize through you. He loves to do his work through you. But remembering that is just kind of a daily thing for me to remember that. Yeah, I think, I mean, all the things that we've ju you just talked about and we've learned. And, and I think the thing in studying for this and having Roland and David Hogan here that has changed everything is it's not how good we are or how we do it. 
we don't ever debate anybody into heaven. You can never Bible <laughs> somebody into heaven. You can't. Or you can't make them a follower of Christ. You can't. Isaiah forty three eleven says, "I alone am the, am the Lord, the only one who can save you." John six forty four says, "No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day." And I think that should be the greatest thing that we've ever heard because there is no longer the pressure on us to perform. <laughs> and I think one of the problems with evangelism today is that we have people are trying to give away something that they've never received. Uh. And I remember when I first went to Germany to play football, I went to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And in this restaurant, the menu was in a language I could not speak. So I didn't know what to order. And so I pointed to the picture and I said, I want that. And they said, we don't have that. Said, okay. I said, well, just that. You know, I just kept pointing at pictures. And I really realized back then, we advertise something that's available that we don't have. And so we could go door to door. We could go feed the homeless. We could preach in churches. We could preach on sidewalks. Yeah. But nobody's going to come to the kingdom of heaven unless he draws them. And for me, that's amazing because I don't have what it takes to bring somebody to heaven. So therefore, the pressure is no longer on me. The only thing available and the pressure on me is, can he use me? Mm -hmm. And how can he use me if I can't hear him? Yeah. And so there are a few questions that I'd like to just walk through. and We'll just talk through them. Mm -hmm. But the first one is, what are the basic principles of evangelism? Well, this is part four of the series, so I imagine that you've defined evan evangelism already. It's the spreading of the Christian gospel by the public preaching or personal witness. Wow. So what are we spreading? I think one of the key things to understand evan evangelism is what are we actually trying to give people? What are we trying to give people? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus. How do you give Jesus if you don't know Jesus? You can't. You can't, right? Okay, good. Well, we did it. Figured it out. <laughs> the reality is, is I think oftentimes we try to give away somebody. Who is the president of the United States? Donald Trump. Okay, you know that, right? Right. Does that mean you know him? No. Why? I've never met him. You don't know him. You've never met him. I think too often we try to give Jesus away like we try to give away a politician. It's I believe so in their good. policies. I believe in what they're running <laughs> for. Or I don't believe in what they're running for. And the reality is... <laughs> Is too often we don't know the person we're trying to give away. Because when you know the person you're trying to give away, gimmicks don't work anymore. Mm -mm. Certain preaching styles don't work. Entertainment doesn't work. There is a confrontation in the spirit that takes place when the Lord leads you somewhere. And I think that's beautiful because it's not us. The next question is this. What does the Bible say about evangelism? There are so many stories. I think about how Jesus stopped at the woman at the well in John 4. And what did she do? She met a man. And she went and told the entire town who came to see him. Mm -hmm. When he goes over uh, to find the demon-possessed man who was, who was possessed by a legion. Mm -hmm. He was one of the first evangelists in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Right? Peter, who stuck his foot in his mouth the entire beginning of every New Testament mm -hmm. book is the first one to preach on a mountain and 3,000 were gathered that day. Did, was Peter such a good speaker that, that 3,000 were added to that day? No. Did Peter have such deep theology because of the seminary school he went to? No. Did he have a perfect track that was written out? No. No, he didn't, right? No, he spoke with the authority of heaven. Because when Jesus said in Matthew 28 and, and Mark 16, he said, go and make disciples. But he also said that all of he all power in heaven and on earth has been given to us. Mm -hmm. Well, what if it hasn't been received by us? What are we giving away? Well, I think about um, and any theological questions you have, <laughs> if we raise them for you, good thing that our pastor is your pastor. So ask him. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Ask your pastor. <laughs> Oh, but I've asked um, Dr. Medius this question before, just to make sure I'm not... Uh -huh. um, I asked Roland Baker about this while he was here. I'm just thinking about 
when he authorized the disciples to go. And there were 72 other disciples that he also authorized. And he gave them, you know, the authority to do miracles. And they came back and they were like so excited that even the demons obeyed them when they used his name. And Jesus, it's just his, his reply is so interesting to me. Yes, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. My personal take on that is, <laughs> y'all are so excited about demons obeying you. I saw the first fall. I saw the, and Satan. If I'm wrong, Dr. Minos, correct me. This is how I see that. Rejoice not only that your that demons obey you, but your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then we see a little bit later when he began to talk about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Many of the disciples deserted him because they couldn't understand this teaching. We also know that his word says that many will come to him on that day and say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. And he'll say, I don't know you. And it's just interesting to me that, that some of his very own disciples who were authorized to go really rejoiced in the power that was given to them, but could not rejoice or even take part in intimacy. The communion was talking about future intimacy that we would have through eating his flesh, drinking of his spirit, drinking the blood, eating this word, knowing him. That's the point, is knowing him. Knowing, knowing him. I also think when you said a while ago, one of my favorite things is when he said, no man can come to me unless he's drawn by the Father. What are we trying to do? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like we're trying desperately to draw people to Jesus like, we're trying to do the work. Jesus didn't even draw people to himself. Didn't you know he could have? I mean, he could have followed the rich young ruler and, and talked like, no, 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 if you'll give away all your money, my word says that whatever you give away, you'll receive it a hundred times over in this life with tribulation or persecution. I can't remember exactly where, what it says right there, but he could have sold him on the principles of giving. <laughs> <laughs> eight, eight week series. Eight week series on giving. Um, but he didn't because he saw the man's heart. I just think about the, the disciples that deserted him when they didn't understand what he was talking about with the flesh and blood. And instead of running after them, them and going, Guys, you don't get it yet, but you will just hang on with me. Come on. We need our core. You guys are some of the best disciples that I have just stick with me instead he turned to the ones with him and said do you want to go too?" Peter there's no way that Peter had received the revelation of what Jesus was talking about but he said where would we go to whom would we go you have the words of life um, and I just think that's really important you're not going to understand everything God tells you to do the key is to, one day I was talking to the Lord and I was like, this issue that I'm having in my heart right now, you're the only one that understands, you're the only one that gets me. <laughs> and I heard the Lord say, that is not the point. The point is that you get me. And I don't always understand him, but I love him. And where else would I go? He has the words of life. All right. So the next question, who can do it? Who can evangelize? Just pastors, right? Just like <laughs> pastors with a ministry and a website. Everyone. Everyone, right? Right. He said, go, therefore, and make mm -hmm. disciples. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. I wrote down Mark 10, 7 through 8. It said, as you preach this message. I lied. It says, as you go, <laughs> preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. It's not just enough to preach. We must demonstrate mm -hmm. the gospel. Yes. Yes. And so I wrote down a few more examples. In Acts 2, Peter preaches and 3,000 are added to their number. 
in Acts 11, 15, as Peter began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the very beginning. In Romans 15, it says, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except that Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done by the power of the Spirit. Uh, Mark 16, 20, the Great Commission, we just talked about it. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. First mm -hmm. Peter 3, 15, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So it's for everybody to do. Mm -hmm. and not those who went to seminary. Not those who were just raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. We've all been raised from the dead. From <laughs> death to life. Amen. I just think it's really interesting. There is an office of an evangelist. But just because you don't have the title Evangelist Kevin. Or Evangelist Cheyenne. <laughs> or Evangelist Remedios. You go. Because that's what his word tells you to do. You go. And he tells you what to say. He tells you where to go. He tells you who to pray for. And I just think it's beautiful how you started it out. It's all about rest and obedience. <laughs> when we rest and obey, there's no other way. <laughs> trust. Trust and obey. There's no other way but to be happy in Jesus, right? Yes. And trust is rest. And I just think there's so, something beautiful and so little pressure on not having to do anything. But just to be available for him to use. Imagine that, being available. Let's go to the second part. How do you prepare for evangelism? How do you prepare? For How do I prepare? For <laughs> How do you prepare for evangelism? How do you prepare? I think it's really interesting. I worked with Fellowship of Christian Athletes for a number of years. And the way I prepared was I made sure I had a long story of my testimony, a medium story of my testimony, and a short story of my testimony. And I think that's incredible to do and to have. But I was preparing about my testimony. What about his testimony? Not just that one day where he saved me when I slipped my hand up during a service with the, the lights down low and the E minor chord playing on the keys and nobody was looking around and I slipped my hand up to receive Jesus, not knowing him, not one little tiny bit. Oh, Jesus. But I was preparing to hope that somebody would be just compelled enough to maybe like want to receive something that the Bible never says. And I think about preparing for evangelism. Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I was preparing by doing those opposite. I was trying to love people out of my own gifts and my own abilities and my own compassion for the Lord. But the Bible doesn't say to love them and then love him. It says love him and then love them. And I think it's really interesting thinking about preparing to evangelize. Maybe an eight-week course, or like, maybe if I memorize the Romans Road, any Baptist people know what I'm talking about, because that's how, obviously, that the Bible works, right? You tell them that Romans 3.23, for all of sin, it falls short of the glory of God. But Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin. You go through all of these scriptures, and you lead them up to where it says, if you confess with your mouth, and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Praise God, let me pray for you. But what does that mean? What is the gospel? How do we prepare? See, it, it took me, I'm 38 years old, and I feel like I'm just figuring out what it means to believe. So all these people that I'm telling them, all you've got to do is believe. What does that even mean? What does that mean? See, it's not to, to learn what it means to believe is not apologetics. That's not just for Ravi Zacharias. That is for us to understand what it means to believe. See, in the Greek, believe means trust. And I think uh, I was trying to give away something that I didn't have. I said I was a believer and a follower of Christ, and yet minute. I didn't trust him. Wait a minute. It means trust. Yeah. To put your trust in him. Because I keep saying that, but I don't know the Greek. So I didn't know technically that that it, that it means trust. 
But I know that I was... We I, talk a lot, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> we prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I lived as a believer, but I didn't trust him. So did you believe? So did I believe. Anyways, that's the next session. <laughs> so how do you prepare? You love God. I love God. Imagine that. You with love what? God. How much do I need to love him? Just with all. That's it. Oh, is that all? Just all. 100%. <laughs> well, how do you love God with all? Where does that start? How do you love anybody? I think there's an interesting scripture. Matthew 6, 6. It says, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I think... I don't know if there's children in the there tonight, but um, I think about when when a husband and a wife are intimate, something is supposed to be produced, and I think that that's not done in public or supposed to be done in public. It's supposed to be private. It's supposed to be intimate. It's supposed to be beautiful and powerful, and I think that what I've learned in 38 years of living on this planet is that most of the stuff I did was in public, so it could be validated. And I don't think that much fruit was produced in my public praying and making sure that I lived such a good life and making sure that everybody knew that I was a believer in Jesus and that I didn't do those bad things. Just because you don't do bad things doesn't mean you believe in Jesus. Yeah. And I think about how hard that is for so many people who claim to love Christ to go into their closet, to lay on their face and let God do what God does. Instead of saying, Lord, I need a new job. How, you know, I need more money. I need a new spouse. I need more children. I need, do you just need him? And I don't know that I could answer that in the way that the Bible tells me I should be able to answer that. Mm -hmm. So how do you prepare? I believe it's getting on your face and humbling yourself. I think too often we're waiting for God to humble us, but he doesn't say, wait till I humble you and then you'll do it. He says, humble yourselves under my mighty hand that I will lift you up in due time. Mm -hmm. Well, what if your, his due time is not your due time? Mm -hmm. Because you're not humbled. <laughs> First Corinthians 1.17, for all those out there who think, well... Um, I'd like to evangelize better, but maybe I don't know enough scriptures, but I do love the Lord, or maybe I don't speak well enough, or um, maybe I don't know the Greek or the Hebrew of every scripture. Praise God, you're there with all of us, so you're right there. <laughs> First Corinthians one seventeen says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. I had too many conversations with people where I was trying to like let them see my viewpoint on what the gospel said. Uh, but I'm not sure I knew exactly what the gospel is. That's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the gospel is? One Sunday night, Shine was gone, and so I was actually talking on a <laughs> Sunday night. And um, I asked the question to the people that were there. I said, why do you believe in Jesus? There was only, what, maybe seven or eight people there. And it was really interesting how flustered several people got. They were like, well, because like, he's the only way. That's great. Why? Well, I grew up in church. Well, oh, good. That'll, it's going to work. What's the point? Like, why do you believe in Jesus? Why? <laughs> why? Why? What does the gospel say? Matthew seven twenty eight through 29. When Jesus had finished saying, finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Mm. I think one of my favorite things about my wife is, yes, she's beautiful. Yes, she's talented. Yes, she knows more scriptures than I can fathom and she somehow runs them all together and she'll start a story and then stop and then somehow finish the story. It's incredible. I don't know how she does it. But my favorite thing about her is that when she walks into a situation, she doesn't go with knowledge or she doesn't go with something that she's studied and so she's going to try to apply that point. She walks in and takes authority of the situation as God leads. And I think there's something beautiful about that because she's not going to be invited to the second largest Hindu temple in the state of Tennessee based on a principle that you learned. She walked up to this woman in Kroger with the authority and the power of Jesus Christ 
and with joy. Talk about that. Because you didn't share a principle with her that worked. No, and um, this is the second largest Hindu temple in America, actually. Referencing something that you just said when you said, I, I don't walk into a room with knowledge of it. I heard from the Lord not too long ago, and he said, if you really want me to speak through you, you have to stop saying what you know. <laughs> In other words, I can talk from my experience, what little I have, my um, the knowledge that I've gained, whatever, that's fine to do sometimes. But a lot of times, what my head thinks or what my heart feels is very different from what the Spirit wants to say. So I can shut him down by saying, if I get there first with my mind and I just dive in with my mind or, or my heart. I remember one time the Lord told me that I was parenting from my head or my heart and that my head was religious and my heart was worldly. And would I let him parent through me? And every time I would listen to him, it was always very different from what I would have said, either from what I thought should happen, or, oh, what I, you know what I mean, the Spirit. So, when I walked up to that lady, and she's a dear friend of mine now, I love her so much, I just loved her, because I didn't have any further instruction past that. I didn't even know she was the priest's wife. I just heard him say, will you love her? Go love her. And so I did. And I loved her without knowing her because God already knows her. That's right. And it was His love. He loved her. And he loves her. Okay? So when I'm loving her and she's feeling, I, and I know she was feeling supernatural love uh, coming through my eyes and, and feeling the love of Jesus. <clears throat> she, I, um, when I found out that her husband was a priest, I said, tell me this. Do you see miracles in your temple? And she said, oh yes, Americans can come in the temple. I said, no, 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 miracles. She said, what do you mean? I said, I mean, can your husband, the priest, if someone is sick, can he lay hands on them and they'll be healed? And she said, no. And I said, I can. And she said, what do you mean? So I started showing her pictures of all these people, including Muslims, who have been healed by Jesus Christ. And in Kroger, she's like in her Hindu Indian uh, um, apparel, she is clapping with joy, saying, oh, this means your God hears you. <laughs> I said, yes, he does. Would you like to get together and talk more about it? <laughs> and that's how I was invited in. <laughs> And you prepared by actually loving God. <laughs> Can I tell another story right there? Go for it. <clears throat> I was sitting in my mom's apartment one day, and the Holy Spirit said, Take her trash out. Well, my mother almost fainted when she saw me about to take her trash out. Honey, don't do that. Your daddy will do that later. And I said, Mom, um, God just told me to take her trash out. She was like, oh, okay. So I get her trash, and I take it to the dumpster, and my boys are with me. And we see a Muslim woman in full cover um, <laughs> walking by, and I heard the Lord say, go be her friend. So I went over to be her friend, and I ended up taking her back into my mom's apartment, she ends up coming to our house on our way to my house. She tells me that my husband says, don't be friends with anyone. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> so why are you coming to my house? And she said, because when you walked by, something said, trust her. Well, after a series of visits with her, um, all led by the Holy Spirit and her invitation, <laughs> God will get you invited into places. <laughs> God's invitation into rest will get you invitations into forbidden places. Mm 
-hmm. where no one but the power of God can take you and you wouldn't want to go. I'll say this, during that season where I was visiting a lot of people um, of other religions, if I got out of rest and I went back into worry, striving, fear, all the doors would close. And later the Lord told me that was my protection. Because the Bible says in Psalms 91, my promises are your armor and protection. So when we put our trust in Him, it's like a bubble is how I see it. Like, whoop, shield of faith. Whoop. However, if I'm going on my own in my worry, striving, and fear, um, the fear, I feel like, attracts the enemy. So that's another topic maybe. But anyway, so... Later on, this lady had a baby, the Muslim lady. I'm in her house, and I went to the restroom, and I had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus walked up to me, and in this vision, and he said, you're not bringing me into this house. And I said, Lord, what do you mean? And he said, I walked through walls. <laughs> I'm like, what? So, I'm like, okay, whatever, I thought I was bringing you into the home, you know? What does this mean? I don't know, but I trust you, Lord. I'm in her room with um, my friend and the baby, and all of a sudden she says, will you tell me about Jesus? And I said, excuse me? <laughs> we had had several visits, and I had not gone there. I just, he didn't ask me to tell her about him that day. He said, will you be her friend? So we had very, very, um, several visits as friends. She would cook food for me. We would be together. This day, she said, will you tell me about Jesus? And I said, what do you mean? Of, co of course I'll tell you about Jesus, but why are you asking? And she said, since I was a little girl and they taught me that uh, Christians were not good and I, and I shouldn't ever trust them. I felt this was not right. And I started praying, one day, would, would you please send a Cristiano friend? And I said, you mean to tell me your prayers brought, brought me here? And she said, yes. <laughs> then I knew why Jesus was saying what he said. I, I couldn't draw her to him. Holy Spirit was already drawing her since she was a little child. So he had, not only, had, oh, woo! Not only had he prepared me for that visit, he had prepared her heart. It was Peter and the centurion, right? Same thing. Who Prepared their heart, told them to send for Peter. The Lord spoke to Peter. Peter Ooh. went. Just beautiful. The whole family gets <laughs> baptized, saved, set free. Let's go to part three since we are on a time limit. My life struggles with that. Sorry. <laughs> so it says, what are, oh, the diff what are the different types of evangelism? Reaching your neighbors, mm -hmm. hospital visits, people in need. I think, uh, I think in one of the other sessions, or maybe all of them, they probably hit on this, so we won't stay here very long. I would just say yes. Yes. Yes to your neighbors. Yes. Yes to hospital visits, people in need, people facing tragedies, workplace, friends, family. Yes. Yes. But I still think it goes back to... I want to also say this real quick because I, it just slipped my mind. She talked a lot about rest in the beginning. Rest is not quitting your job and watching movies all day and waiting on the Lord. <laughs> That's not waiting on the Lord. Matter of fact, That's that so that good. word "wait on the Lord" is like like a waiter serving. You don't you still serve while you're waiting. Yes. It's not sitting and doing nothing. No. It's not resting and sleeping all day to get your rest. It's not natural rest. No. It's supernatural rest. It's active trust. And so, like, yes, take courses on Hebrew and Greek. Study <laughs> your Bible. Go to church. We're not saying don't do any of those things. Right. I just want a disclaimer. Do all of them because that. too many people. <laughs> Just do all those things or they do none. I think mm -hmm. if it's not led by the Spirit, then you're back into wow. having all this head knowledge with the lack of wisdom to be able to use the knowledge that you have. Mm -hmm. So that's great that you can study and you can speak different languages. That's incredible, but if you don't know him, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Should we know both? I believe yes, we should do Ooh. both. Yeah. So I just disclaimer, because you don't rest and do nothing. Please don't quit your job and say that Cheyenne said so. Ah, please. Okay, so please. the different types of evangelism. Uh, disclaimer also, we're not saying don't set up evangelist, 
evangelistic outreaches. They are incredible. Please do those. Do it. Do them all the time. Those just can't be the point. Yeah. It's still loving God with all your heart, mind, yes. soul, and strength. You can't lean on your strategy. And so I wrote this down. I said, I think too often we have a plan in place of what we're going to do, what we're going to say, and how it's going to go. Yeah. Man. There are too many people that have come around, especially here in this body, where if we had a plan of what to say, how to say it, how it's going to go, we would have been stuck in the mud. My little bitty testimony of what God did in my life 20 years ago isn't going to touch somebody who's demon-possessed. Because if I prepared what I'm going to say and I'm not listening and obeying what he's saying, once again, not bad about the testimony, it's just not the point. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. It's not our blood. And it's his testimony of what he's done in and through our lives. And there's an authority and a power that goes with that. So I do. I say yes to your neighbors. Bake your neighbor pie. Bring them coffee. I don't know. Do whatever you can do. Rake their leaves. Be sweet, but it's not about that. Mm -hmm. Go visit hospitals. Yes, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. You could pray for the entire hospital. Mm -hmm. But if the Lord has one person he wants you to pray for, he's probably got a plan and a purpose around the one person instead of the thousand you're trying to pray for out of your own compassion. Mm -hmm. So I wrote down, I believe that we are to live in such a way that we don't have to have an outreach ministry planned every two days to try to get everybody involved. Mm -hmm. Because we're so connected to the Father that He's going to lead us to the people that He wants to touch. It all goes back to, are we hearing His voice? Mm -hmm. And when we hear His voice, are we, are we listening? Mm -hmm. Like, Are we able to hear? Are we able to recognize it? Mm -hmm. I had a vision, maybe the only vision I've ever had in my life is that I was at a church, a very large church, and I was on stage with somebody who spoke in a different accent. And it was weird but he had everybody close their eyes and he spoke and he said do you know which one of us spoke it was obvious he talked very differently than me and they said yeah it was you we heard your voice we heard uh the way you spoke we heard your different accent and god says the problem is is they know his voice because they spend time with him mm -hmm. people don't know my voice because they don't spend time with me so they, they they hear my voice but they don't recognize it as mine and I think it's really, really interesting. I look back on my life and I wonder how many doors I went through just because they were open, not because God said, because I didn't recognize his voice. And I think outreach and evangelism, all is in that vein. You obey what you hear. And make no mistake, the devil is going to lead you places that we should never go. And the Lord's going to lead you places in the natural you should never go. But you've got to recognize his voice. And so I wrote this down. And you're going to write it down too. I believe that evangelism, uh, evangelism comes down to three things. The first one is this. Are we loving God? We talk often here about, uh, especially here in Nashville, I don't know what it's like there. But I do know that I hear all the time, I'm just loved. I am so loved by God. That's, that's true. Who's loved by God? The world. The world, which is who? Everybody. God loves everybody. That is signed, sealed, that's done deal. But are we loving God? Do you love God? The second thing is this. Are we listening to when he speaks and when he leads? And then number three, are we obeying what he tells us to do and go where he tells us to go? Mm -hmm. Those three are very, very important. Mm -hmm. It's the Christian life. And then the, the last part, part four, is um, how do we do evangelism? Matthew 10, 7-8 says, As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. We have already spoken about that, but I think it's the, the key point of this. You give away what you've received if you have not received what he is calling you to do. Then you can't give it away. Well, the kingdom, I've said several times... Um, I hear so much talked about building the kingdom, and I can't find the scripture for it. Um, if y'all have it, send it to me, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I do see receiving the kingdom. And the kingdom is within you, Jesus said. And, and, you know, I see a lot of people, I mean, I remember when he filled me with peace, and I remember 
the Holy Spirit saying, do you feel that? And I said, yes, it's peace. I haven't felt this in years. And, and I felt him say, this is my kingdom. This is my presence. This is me. Measure your moments by this. And never allow a situation or circumstance just to justify lack of it. And I realized, well, what is the kingdom? The kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so I see many times, and I myself, for years and years, was busy working, building the kingdom. But I had not received <laughs> the kingdom. I had not received the kingdom. And so I was working like a little worker ant. You know, worker, worker, work, 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 work. With no rest, no peace, no joy. Mm -hmm. Living in my own righteousness, self-righteousness, filthy rags. And that's why I had guilt and worry and striving. But when I received the king, <laughs> the king of the kingdom, the king received him, there's the righteousness, the peace and joy. And then he's able to build his kingdom through me, through you, through you, through everyone who is willing to receive the kingdom. And the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. So how do you evangelize? I think um, as we as we go to close here, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven is a verse that has become Christianese. Almost everybody speaks that language of the good plans and the good hope and the good future for your life. And while that's true, because He is good, I want to leave you with this as it relates to how do you evangelize. Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen says, "You will seek me and find me." when you seek me with all of your heart. And I think it goes all back to the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so if we could do anything, um, I don't know that we taught anything at all. The Lord, the Lord is the only thing that can teach, the only one that can guide and lead. But there are no strategies on this planet that we want to try to leave, with, leave you with because we haven't found any of those to stay working. There is something that will work one day, but as soon as I feel like I get comfortable in that, God shakes me up and that no longer works. And so <laughs> I don't want to tell you something that no longer works for us. But I do know this, that what never fails Ooh. is not that he, he loves us. Yes, that never fails. But what never fails is that when we seek him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, it no longer becomes about us. It no longer becomes about you. It doesn't even become about that person. It becomes about him. Because he loves that person more than you ever could or that I ever could, no matter what. And so how do you do it? You seek him. Right, well, and I just, oh, this is so good. Listen, because, like, if you see people trying to build a kingdom that they haven't entered, like striving to build the kingdom, and what we're supposed to do is strive to enter into rest and let him build his kingdom through those who are receiving the kingdom. And then I'm thinking about this. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Right. He came to do it, so we are free to seek him. We seek the seeker. We are. To I have total permission to seek him, to seek the kingdom. Woo! Seek ye first the kingdom and his, and his righteousness. And I'm just thinking about like when we try to be zealous for him, zealous good with wisdom, with Holy Spirit. We try to be zealous for him and compassionate for the lost. I'm just going to give compassion, compassion, compassion. That's great. But a lot of people have compassion for the world. Worldly people have compassion for the world. So what has to come first is passion for him. And as we seek the seeker, he can <laughs> find them and draw them to him in us. But we, we cannot ever... We can't draw them to us and think that they'll That's find right. him. That's right. He wants to do it. Yeah, this this whole teaching series has kind of rocked my world because it's a, it's made me go back and think about, unfortunately, most of the ways that I've done it have been wrong. And I've done it out of my own motives instead of his. And so, forgive me, Lord, I apologize. Um, but we'd love to pray with you as we close. And... Um, 